Well, I encourage you to start on time, and so we're going to start uh, on time as close as I can, and so I'm excited that you're here. Um, I look forward to this meeting every uh, quarter, and with the quarters we don't have it, I get antsy that you're going to forget who I am, and so um, I don't want that to happen, but um, we're, this, tonight is a little bit different in that not so much a training feature, we're going to look ahead tonight. We're going to look ahead in the short term and so if everything goes well um, what I hope to is when we dismiss we'll sneak over to the building if you haven't had a peek in the building yet um, as leaders we're gonna peek in the building okay and I'll when we get up get a little closer I'll give you some final instructions for that so let's start with a word of prayer and then uh, we'll continue from that okay gracious Heavenly Father I thank you for this evening and for the great faculty that we have at First Baptist that that labors so diligently to teach God's Word each and every week, Lord. Um, as we look to the future, let us think about and begin to pray about and search you for still yet even better ways to lead people to discover who you are, to know you, and to be discipled so that they can take their place and the role of being a disciple lur as well. Lord, bless this time. Uh, give it back to my friends tenfold. I pray this in your name. Amen. So I know we've got some deacons in here, so we're going to step through some things. And if it looks like I'm squinting, I am. The lights are bright. And so let's kind of talk about what we're going to do. How many, everybody's picked up their packet. I know I've got one error so far. My wife's packet is, is AWOL. And so we'll have to track that down. But everybody find their packet of, of material and stuff. Uh, just some things that you know. I mean, this is old hat for, for those of you that have been here season after season. But we always have a new teacher or two. So in the packet, there should be a group directory. Um, if we, your group has prospects, we'll have a list of prospects in there. You'll have an attendance uh, record over time. And there'll be an adult division attendance breakdown generally. And then um, I don't know that Sherry put it on the sheet this time, uh, how to calculate your involvement. That's where we take the, the total number of people that have been two or more Sundays in the last month. We add to that those people that we have sent out to teach someplace else. Then we divide that by our enrollment and we wind up with a ratio. I hope that you're looking at that periodically. Um, I, I think it's going to be a great tool for us to use long term. I know we have struggled for years and years trying to figure out which is more important, attendance or enrollment. Both of those are important, but how do we do something with that? And I think this factoring and calculating involvement is, is going to be the thing that really is going to help us moving forward as we um, look at how to, to judge what's going on. And I think that's really what it is. It gives us a tool as leaders to make some value judgments as to what's happening in our classes. And so uh, I'm still kind of experimenting with a mass way to do that for the entire division. I haven't quite got all the bugs worked out. So when I do, I'll, I'll show you all my handiwork um, when we get to that point where I've got it all figured out. So that's kind of what's in the packet. Um, I highlighted some things in blue tonight in our mission statement. Um, we're doing a lot to kind of help our church learn this statement. And so I want us to kind of each and every week kind of look at it as well. I've got um, the church's one that we've been learning in worship up in the corner in the fine print. I know you've learned that by now, so I'm not going to give you a pop quiz on it, okay? But our mission that part of the overall church mission that we're charged with is this statement of, and I got to turn around and lead it this way, um, to, to greater equip our people for ministry with, with biblical communities and Sunday school being our primary mechanism of discipleship and relational connection. And I went out and highlighted those two phrases in there because they're really at the heart of what we do. We're wanting to disciple people for ministry. We want to see them become equipped so that they can carry on the work of the church. If this church is going to continue to grow, one of the things that it has to do is continue to equip disciplers. 
people that are going to make the time and the investment to see people grow and become leaders. Um, I, I am hopeful that over the next calendar year, we'll be able to start five new Sunday school classes. And why is that important? I have a feeling that there is a chance that we will lose two or three Sunday school classes this year. Not by any fault of their own. They're just aging. And that's a reality that a, tr a family always deals with. Every time I get up, every Sunday morning, I'm a little bit older each and every Sunday. And we have some classes that have worked faithfully for decades and decades. But we're beginning to see those classes reach a point where um, they may have no members left. And so that's becoming a reality in a couple classes. So if we start five new groups, we may only net two or three this year. And so that's going to be so important for us as we begin to look into those younger groups, people in their 50s, 40s, 30s, and 20s, and we begin to open up opportunities for them to lead some Bible studies. Um, that is going to be a, a challenging process for us. The other thing that I highlighted was discipleship and relation, relationships. Um, I am becoming uh, just always amazed at the glue that, that our biblical community and Sunday school structure provides for. I probably could spend the rest of the hour and just let you go around and talk about what you've seen God do through your groups. Because I follow your prayer sheets, and I know that there are ministry, ministries happening in each and every group as I look around the room here that I know that you're praying for or you're involved in or meals are being carried out, uh, Caring Bridge notifications are going out. There's a lot of ministry and care that that's testifies to the depth of relationships. I want to pick on John Thornell's class this morning because that was one of the classes that I visited. Um, and I walked in and it reminded me of an eighth grade dance. You know, you've been to the eighth grade dance, right? What happens at the eighth grade, grade dance? So he's not, you're a fabulous educator. She's given the signal. Ladies on this side, gentlemen on this side. That's exactly what was going on in the room. However, there were stories in ministry happening in both of those circles. And I was so pleased to see that. And then I started getting reports of, well, so-and-so is missing or we're waiting on so-and-so to arrive. And, and so I just kind of went out the back door. I don't think you ever even noticed I left, did you? Oh, did you? Good. I feel better. Um, because ministry was happening in, in, at a deep level, and I, and I appreciate that. You know, as I walk down the hallway and I listen to what's going on, I'm always amazed at how good we're doing at the relationship part of things. We need to continue to do that. Um, that time of fellowship is so very important, um, and we, I try to make sure that we at least have that, um, but also that we're focused on the, the discipling part of that, where we're kind of helping people grow into some leadership roles. And so I just want to hold that before you um, as we talk about uh, different things. I feel like I'm racing. Do I sound like I'm racing? Okay, good. I'll just kind of keep this pace then. Um, let's talk about just our ministry health and statistics right now. This um, is, a, is a graph I haven't done before because normally I don't really care about this, but I got to looking for answers. Um, and this is going to come out here in a minute, so I'll just go ahead and, and kind of lay some things out. Where that orange line is riding, it's about 30 people lower than where it was last time. So over 11 weeks, our average attendance in Bible study has dropped 30 people. Now, I'm not saying that I'm alarmed, but I chose orange and yellows for a reason. Okay, and so we're going to talk about, about those kinds of things. But, but I wanted to make sure that, that we hadn't uh, skewed something or that I was picking up on the just following the church's general trend. So the blue line is actually total attendance. And so if you look at that, you, the numbers are really small and you can't really read it really well. 
um, if you want to look at the each individual Sunday numbers, you can. But if we start on the far, your left, that's 517 is the total church number, and um, 335 is the total adult division number. And so we just kind of follow along. So the first big dip, or the first gap, you're kind of like, why is the dots kind of skewed? Well, that's Christmas. Christmas never helps my average. And I'm on record. I've complained about it for six straight years. I'm gonna, not going to complain about it this year, but Christmas doesn't help my average. But that's good. There's a lot of great things that do help what goes on at First Baptist. We had an outstanding number of people say, hey, tell me about how I accept Jesus Christ. I got the opportunity to call five people. We just divvied it up among staff. I got to call five people and talk to them about checking a box on the card that says, hey, I want to know more about being a Christian. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll trade a Sunday for that most times, okay? So I'm on record for saying that. The next Sunday, the really low dip, that's uh, New Year's Eve. That was a bad weather Sunday. That was the Sunday we were all worried about the ice and, and everything. And so, oh, I'm, a little, I'm okay with that one. And it popped back up the next week, not as high. But then we kind of did about a two, really the whole rest of the graph is low. And, and I'm attributing that to the flu, okay? Especially that first two-week dip where it just kind of goes down. And so that's kind of the bad flu day. So, okay, so we've moved our Sunday school, jumbled everybody around. We've got people, classes that don't really fit in rooms and stuff. And so I, I kind of expected that. It's, we're a little low for Christmas. I, I'm, I can deal with that. Um, Bad weather Sunday, that's going to happen now and then. I can kind of deal with that. Um, flu, it's been really bad this year. I, I can kind of rationalize that one too. But what I'm struggling with is that overall 30 people down kind of issue. Um, I'm not going to sound the alarm this time, but I'm concerned. And, and I'll be honest with you. I told the staff that I was just with this group, I can be honest. And I'm just a little, little bit concerned about that. It's a trend I don't want to see continued, okay? So I, I just want to be honest with you about that and kind of what, what's going to be reflected in, in some of the numbers. So if we go and we look at enrollment, somebody should finish the graph. Um, there we go. So in the last summer, fall, when we met, we had uh, 844. Uh, We're down 20. We know there's a couple of Sunday school classes that are kind of aggressively working their records and kind of doing some cleanup. And so um, it's not, this quarter is not always our best enrollment quarter anyway. So I'm okay with that. It's down a little bit, but um, it typically, this is, our, is, is a dip for us. It's not a huge one, but 20 is a pretty good sized number considering that we've been adding people to our Sunday school. Most everybody that's joined our church this quarter was already involved in a Bible study. And so we're, we lost a little bit there. Um, decrease, pardon? Uh, no, I mean, I, I, can, I can start thinking about varying people like um, uh, Orville and Evelyn had, uh, she had surgery, so they were both out. You know, and I start going through that. Um, we've had a family out of um, the connected class transfer to Houston. You know, so we can start kind of doing that. We had a couple classes working records. But anytime we start seeing decreases, especially this is our second quarter of decreased enrollment, not much last time, a little bit more this time, that's an indication that our classes are saturating. Okay, and so that, what happens when I say saturating, kind of what happens is people walk in the room and they go, everybody's here, the chairs are all full. And, and by, by that, what we're saying is we, we're not cognizant of who's missing. And so being cognizant of who's missing is a huge part of keeping our Sunday school growing. And there's some trends we've talked about in here about people aren't as faithful week in and week out as they used to be. Uh, you know, we touched on all those kind of things. But we need to be diligent 
in involving people in our classes to contact absentees, okay? And that's just where the bottom line is for, for this quarter. We just need to be diligent. Uh, average weekly attendance, summer and fall, uh, we had 363, which is okay. It's not, given everything that's happened, I'm okay with it. Um, we hadn't really taken a big decrease or anything until we get to the winter quarter. And so we're down 39 in average weekly attendance. And so that's a pretty big increase, and we've touched on all things. The move factors into it. I know people that, you know, it's, it's too far to walk to John Thornell's class. And if you haven't walked to John Thornell's class, start at the far parking lot and walk all the way to the building, through the building, all the way around to the far end of the building. I figure for some of the people, and go upstairs, for some of the people attending John's class, we have made it a, almost a five block walk for some of our older adults. And there's just some people that that's just taxing them. And so, um, and I'm aware of that. Uh, Christmas, we touched on that, weather, flu. Um, and I wonder about if we're losing focus, that saturation issue, we're focused on the good fellowship. I've heard lots of positive comments about being in the gym. We love that homey feeling in the gym. And, and so I wonder if we're losing focus on who's not here. That's just a question. And the statistics will start to answer that for me, okay? Um, ratio of attendance, uh, obviously it's gonna be lower. So, um, so here's what's interesting about this. It's been a long time since we were below 40%. Matter of fact, it's almost six years. Um, when I came here, we were below 40%, and you remember we started talking about we're gonna get that ratio up. And we got pretty high into the 40s, and so now we're, we're beginning to, you know, kind of slide in that. And so how, the question that I have is how aggressive are we in contacting absentees? We need to, to think about those, those types of things. It's really hard to get people here, but we can't take for granted that they're here and that we have to do nothing to build relationships with them or make them feel welcome. So um, measuring group engagement, we've, we've talked about that, how you do that um, several times, so I won't go back over that. Um, if you want to get it and need to, to read through it again, it's, it'll be on the website and all the handouts, the presentation goes there. But basically you're just gonna look, look at your, you know, look for one month's enrollment, add the total number of people who've been two or more Sundays, and then um, plus anybody that your class has sent out to lead in a Bible study, and then divide that by your total enrollment and you'll come up with an involvement ratio. It's not really something that you need to calculate every week. You drive yourself crazy doing that. But if we're doing it once a month, you know, a couple times a quarter, I think it'll help you kind of gauge where your group is going. If you're stable, if you're declining, if you're growing, you'll see that reflected in that number. Uh, teaching units, uh, 33 to 33, no change. However, we talked about there's a possibility we might lose a couple of units. Um, and so, however, as we, we look at it, um, we're losing our teacher for singles two. Um, so we're in the looking for and praying about what we're gonna do with singles two ministry. That's those people that are in their mid thirties to, to Terry's class. So, you know, forties, fifties kind of single adults. Um, we've got just a very few coming that are attending that group. So we're t I'm doing some investigating and asking people, tell me about how this class meets your needs or tell me about, and this is always a fun conversation, tell me about why you're not coming. Uh, I have that conversation with people. Um, and so we've got a couple classes that are, are low. I, I never worry about what the actual number in your class is. Um, we've got some, our teachers like Jack and Joe that because of just what's happening in the lives of their people, their groups are getting smaller. And uh, Jack and Joe will tell you the same thing. As long as there's good fellowship, quality Bible study, and you've got one or two people coming, you're a viable class and you're doing what God needs you to be doing. Um, once we kind of get below that, it's really disheartening um, to, to deal with a class that has nobody in it. And so those are coming. So there's some howevers out there for us. 
Um, leaders, potential leaders, uh, 63 teachers down to 35. Uh, it went from down two, and that's just because we had a couple people move and you know transfer to some other areas. So we're, they were expected, uh, but we need to continue to develop a leadership. Um, what's not reflected in this, Bobby Ann will be going to student ministry. There's two ladies coming in to take Bobby Ann's place. And so that'll change the number. So our, the teaching number, I always expect it to move a little bit. It's not moved anything drastically. Uh, I look at your attendance as Sunday school leadership. And for the most part, uh, it's stellar. Yeah. It's, it's almost better than mine. Um, and so I appreciate that. And so I encourage you. I, I just I think it's great what you do week in and week out. Um, prospects, this one kind of surprised me. So in the, in the summer when we met, we had 369 prospects. We're down to 318 prospects now. And so um, that's a decrease of 51 people. Um, we're, there's three things that are going on. Because uh, I, I kind of looked at the numbers and did some investigating this past week. So three things are happening. One is um, people that are joining our church don't some of them never make it to the prospect file now like the short family the you have the cute little boy jackson that joined last week if you haven't met jackson meet jackson he's a treat um they they came in they went in the prospect file and immediately came out because they joined loved first baptist joined the church joined sunday school and they're already plugged in and asking the today in the leadership meeting what are some you know volunteering for vacation bible school so we've got a group of people that are like that. The last three or four prospect families pretty much didn't even really touch the prospect file. Um, true to my promise to you, as prospects begin to get uh, two years old, I look at them, and if there's no activity, we haven't touched them in two years, I'm deleting them. We're not going to just let that pile pile up and you know call somebody 10 years from now and go, hey, we're glad you visited First Baptist. That you know, just doesn't reflect well. And so um, I'm, we've been in this long enough now that the computer every week gives me three or four names that I go through. Some of them there's activity on, and I put them back in the system, and away we go. But if they haven't had any other activity other than we picked up the name, after two years they're going out of the system. And so that's uh, beginning to happen um, to the, those people in the prospect file. Yeah, Jack. Yeah, and that's going to change. We're, when we get back into the sanctuary, um, we'll go back to having the contact card. It's just a, and, and that's the other thing is we're just doing things differently right now. It's a little bit harder to get people to register. Um, there's no, you can't pull out a hymn book and write on something. The convenience factor for a lot of people just isn't there. And uh, probably fourth, we're just seeing it take longer and longer for people to say, hey, we're going to get in. We're going to give you some information enough that we can contact them because we won't give them to you unless there is at least one. We have a full name, a, can identify a group that think we can put them in, and at least one way to contact them. So sometimes we'll get um, Jake Stare. That's all we get. Well, we can't. We don't know enough to assign him to anybody or for how to even contact him. So we don't even bother with those people. So we have a fair number of those. But that's dropping, and and I hope when we move back across the building, it'll pick back up, um, because that really is a, a measure of potential for us. Okay. Any questions about that? I'm trying to move it along here, because I think the next part's actually going to be funner. <laughs> All right. If we can make fun a verb. All right, no questions? All right. Let's talk about moving forward. Um, as we think about moving forward and what we're doing as we proclaim him um, to anyone that will listen, basically, um, there are some things that are out there for us that we need to start thinking about, be getting prepared for, and begin to make some decisions about and so tonight is kind of I'm going to give you a bunch of information let you know kind of the process and then I want you to go into your prayer closet do some research mull it over pray about it 
and then um, talk to me, ask lots of questions. We need to have a dialogue over the next few months about some of this stuff because I think they're really good changes. But how do we really take advantage of them? Okay. So as we look forward, let's talk about transition back to the building. So I'm excited about this. And so um, the nation of Israelites followed the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud. It happens to be parked over the tabernacle. And uh, I'm excited about that as we th begin to think about going back. Yes, Jack. <laughs> but um, I was trying to keep this a spiritual thing, okay? Um, but you can go read that story, and it's a, it's a great story. But there are some things that will not happen. So let's deal with what I can tell you will not happen, okay? So the first thing is, um, as we begin, oh, that's the schedule. Let's talk about what won't happen. Uh, as we begin to move forward, we will not change Sunday school rooms on Easter Sunday, okay? So you can just... If anybody asks, do you think we'll change on Easter? Say, nope, not unless we can force Larry to do it. And he said he's not going to do it by the hair on his chinny chin chin. Um, Easter, we ha it takes us just knowing you and communicating with you. It takes us about two weeks to get the word out. And so, um, so there's a kind of a schedule of how this is going to unfold. The first people beside, after the staff learns about it is I'm going to send you an email saying something to the effect of we have the keys, okay? And once we have the keys, then we be can begin to actually make a little bit firmer plan, okay? So right now, unless Bob Hawkins knows something I don't know, they're talking somewhere that we might be uh, have our certificate of occupancy the 11th or the 18th. So know this, that certificate of occupancy has been sliding slowly backwards. You know, I think this is the third estimate of time that we've received. And so I, I'm always excited about it. I nod my head. I start thinking about what happens, and I always come back to... We're not moving on Easter. It's going to take at least two weeks to let everybody know um, what's, a, what's a logical way to do this. And so we need to have a schedule. Whoops, go back. Why did my schedule not show? That's that. That's that. There we go. Um, the schedule basically is two weeks of publicity. Um, follow, you know, with the normal, uh, you know, church announcements and that sort of stuff. But I want to give you two weeks to let your classes know because your email is probably the second most effective vehicle of communication in the church. So, and you're encouraging people on Sunday. So let's say we, we get the keys on, on uh, what that would be March the 9th. And I could let you know so that you could begin announcing to your Sunday school the next week. So if we could get it turned around that fast, there is an outside, and I do mean if you like to bet on the 101 long shot, okay, don't ever do that. It's bad money um, that we might move on the 25th. However, just because that schedule's been sliding I automatically, when they said the 11th or the 18th, I automatically kind of lean to the 18th, okay? So even if we find out, you know, midweek, you know, the 11th, it, that's just cutting it close. So if we find out that we could begin talking about it on the 18th, then we've got 1825, that puts the move on, Easter won't happen, okay? So if we find out any time at or beyond the 18th, automat or uh, at or beyond the 11th, we're automatically to the Sunday after Easter, okay? So right now, if you were to say, Larry, what do you think will happen? Um, I would say there is a possibility Sunday after Easter, okay, which would be the 8th. Now, 
you're sworn to secrecy. You cannot quote me. You cannot say Larry said or I heard it from a good authority. You can't say anything like that. But I do want to, to let you know that I'm, my goal is that you get two full Sundays to announce it before we move. There also is a lot of stuff that's got to me move back. Because one of the things you'll notice when we take the go across the street and kind of walk around in the building, if you had a closet in your room, it's not there. And so there's a lot of things to figure out between now and then. Uh, you know, can't, where do those closets go? Can we reinstall them? You know, there, there are closets, that, there are bathrooms that we're using as closets that are just totally not even there anymore. And so the building has gone through some changes. Um, not, you, you'll still recognize it as your church, trust me. But just the, some of the rooms are configured a little bit differently or shaped a little bit differently. There's just some changes that it may take us a little bit more than the two weeks, but two weeks is the minimum, okay? So uh, if I'm guessing, I'm going to guess it's around the 8th or the Sunday following. That's my best guess today. And that's literally all you're getting is Larry's best guess, okay? Questions about the transition or the move? Okay, going once, going twice. All right. Um, I think I covered all that. I did. Um, so let's look ahead. This is what I really want to talk about tonight. So if we're looking ahead, um, Lifeway is in the process of making some changes and making more changes. Okay. And so I'm personally I'm excited about these changes from a education a Christian educator perspective. I think they're good. They touch on some of the things that we've been trying to encourage all along, like Bible reading and, and you know, getting more into the Word and those sort of things. And so as we talk about these changes, um, kind of knowing what's coming is, is going to be important to you so that you kind of know what to be looking for because you're going to get some, just in your uh, personal study guides and leaders books, you're going to get some basic advertisements start appearing. Um, and you're going to get a, probably at some point a packet from me that will have what are known as the slicks. And so that will be a two-lesson sample so that you can kind of look at it and kind of begin to kind of look at how it comes together and those sort of things. Um, and so on Sunday morning, we have people... And, and I did the four biggest curriculum lines that we use. We actually have people in six different curriculums, okay? So it's one of the things that makes it very, very hard for me to do a weekly workers' meeting because the largest group of our Sunday school leaders is Gospel Project. Most of our, about half of our classes are Gospel Project, okay? The next largest group is Explore the Bible, um, and then followed by that is 50-50 uh, is between um, Bible Studies for Life and uh, Connect 360. Connect 360 is uh, the Sunday School curriculum is produced by the BGTC. Uh, it's Pathways. I always say the wrong thing. Is that right, Jerry? It's Pathways is the total name. Baptist Way. That's what I'm after. It's Pathways in another place I was. So Baptist Way, and they did a major overhaul this past year. Uh, introduced a bunch of new writers, uh, kind of brought their format into a more digital delivery, um, uh, put some more resources into teaching materials, and um, it's, it's turning into be a pretty decent curriculum. Um, and so we have people in that. Bible Studies for Life is the old Ventures and Pathways study. Um, that is more of the topical. We only have about two classes that are using that material. And so by and large, the, and then we do have um, one group that does Master Life and one, uh, two groups that, or one group that does uh, Self-Developed. Okay, so those are the six curriculums. And so um, we're kind of spread all over the map and I try to stay a little bit versed in um, all six of those curriculum lines. So research, as we start moving forward, 
is um, the, the largest research project ever conducted on effective discipleship was done by Lifeway. Um, it, it's spawned a whole bunch of changes. Um, we, we have used part of it here. If you remember the church survey that we took, the transformational church material, that is part of the research. So our church fed into this as LifeWay looked at aggregates of numbers of what churches are doing, how churches are feeling about different things. And so they kind of boiled it down to um, healthy churches lead people to connect to God's word both individually uh, on a daily basis and in the group. And, and we know that connection doesn't happen automatically, doesn't happen by accident. We need to be intentional about encouraging our people to be in God's word. We need to get resources to them because um, a lot of people will come to me and say, what's a good Bible, what's a good way to study God's word? Well, that's a pretty open-ended question. And lots of ways of going about it, but what's, what's a, a way that would produce results? Um, how do we get a new believer into a cycle that's going to help them grow? And we do have a lot of new believers, or we have people that come from different um, evangelical backgrounds. We even have people that come from different um, religions that are part of our church uh, that come, come here for Bible study. So how do we begin to pick them up where they are and help them get in a growing process of becoming a disciple? Um, so this, this all comes from, and I'm going to give you the handouts for these things. And so there, I've got four or five handouts stapled together that I'll give you here in a minute or as you get ready to leave. And so this all comes from um, the ideal uh, tool for discipleship from group ministry. And so the ideal tool is a personal study guide. That's that resource that we encourage people to take at the beginning of the quarter and, and use it. And so... That, does, that tool is good for these reasons. One is it is a personal Bible study reading tool. There is an opportunity to kind of break that thing down and get into reading of God's Word. And, and for this group, you're going, oh, that's not very much, Larry. If you look at statistically how much Scripture people actually read during the week, there's a reason you're a Bible study teacher and they're not. Is because they haven't developed a passion for God's Word yet. So how do we get people taking baby steps? Well, if we're, if if we're going to talk about this, there's an incentive to read about this. And so how we kind of coach them into doing that, but it begins to be a good tool for personal Bible study reading. Um, it's a good personal study aid. Um, one of the things that, like, if you teach something that's not a Southern Baptist Sunday school study, the first thing that you're probably going to go out and buy or be looking for is some sort of commentary. It's already added in. You're, you might be looking for some little fact. It's already added in. Uh, one of the things I really like about Gospel Project is, have you ever wondered how this relates doctrinally to what Southern Baptists are trying to accomplish? Well, in the Gospel Project, it's blocked out in a little box, and they're even numbered. Like, they have 1 to 99 doctrinal pinnings that are important to teach. And they're even numbered when you, when you run across a passage that touches on them. And so, illustrations, insights, all that's there, especially if you get the kit and those types of things. Um, and then, it's a guide to prepare for the group discussion. Somebody was talking to me today about the reason their daughter doesn't come is because she thinks it's fluff. I said, well, she's, she's not been to Bible study here yet. And I said, well, it's not fluff here because a lot of our classes, we can encourage discussion. And we're, we're going to give her a book that she can prepare for the discussion. And her comment was she would like that. And so um, I realize the quarterlies don't always get used. Some people take them home and probably never crack them open. But the ones that do get used uh, produce good results. And so how do we start upping the use of a, 
of that personal study guide. Um, here's just a few ways, and I'm going to give you a longer list. It's on the side, uh, an out box on one of the handouts. But here's just a couple that I, I routinely give out to people when they say, hey, how do we get you know, more people involved? How do we do discipleship? Remind your group frequently of the importance of their own personal discipleship and how the study guide can aid their spiritual growth. If you say something like, I didn't have time for this, but you would really probably enjoy it if you go home and read this. It's on page whatever. There's a lot of people in your group that are going to go, huh, I may check that out. And that's a good thing because then they're going to check out something else. Okay? But that's just a, an easy way of doing it is we have to talk about, you know, work it into our, the way we talk about the quarterly or the, what we call the quarterly personal study guide. Um, because it's really changed a lot since I started in 83 when we still called it a quarterly. It is a drastically different piece of material. Drastically different. Um, another one that I like using is this one. Using Shelby Next or social media, contact members uh, to respond to a particular quote from the personal study guide and include the page number. Do a little poll. Just say, hey, I'm taking a poll for Sunday's lesson. What's your opinion of this? And see what comes back, you know. Make it a little, little fun to kind of dwell in there and um, look at what's going on in the curriculum. Um, this one, uh, we have several people that have tried this and like doing it. Ask a member of your group to summarize a whole section. You know, that material that you're teaching from is written for an hour and 15 minutes. If you take your time leisurely and go through it and allow for ample discussion, an hour and 15 minutes. There is no way you're going to get an hour and 15 minutes right now at First Baptist. I would love that. I long for it. I want that. I work towards it. But it's just not happening next Sunday. But ask somebody in your class to summarize a section in two minutes. Give them a time limit. Tell them, I just want the big picture, but let them kind of summarize it and pass that roll around. Great tool. There are about seven others that are listed in this, and it's going to be on the side of that, that tool, uh, that one of those handouts. And so you can read through them, and, and I won't bore you with that. But I do know that those things work. Um, uh, changes to the tools. Okay? So what's coming? Well, this year in... Um, uh, explore the Bible, LifeWay introduced, in addition to the personal study guide, we have the choice to um, order the Daily Disciple Guide, okay? And so what the Daily Disciple Guide does is it is a different formatting of the personal study guide. And the only person that's using it right now is Daniel Harris, okay? And so I, every now and then I ask Daniel what he thinks about it. But here's what they've done. They have the Sunday morning experience, and then they have five Bible, daily Bible readings that follow it. They're, what, about a page, page and a half, roughly, give or take. Uh, couple, every once in a while you get one, it's a half a page, and maybe the next one's a little longer. But they're about a page of the book, roughly. And then there is um, a, a section that's talk about it. And so the... What LifeWay is encouraging is that you would do the lesson, five daily Bible studies, at some point in the, the uh, outlaying or the, the week, you would have a subgroup in your class that might get together over a coffee or if they're working at the same office, they have lots of suggestions, but they might get together and do the talk about it question just to kind of recap now, I was at an educator's meeting, and we were kind of discussing this, and somebody came up with the, the great idea. If the teacher started with the daily Bible reading, they would pretty much be prepared to teach, and it becomes, a somebody said, about a two-week experience to, so like, slowly work your way through the content to be well-prepared for people to follow up, have discussion, because what do we know? When people are in God's Word and they're talking about God's Word, they're growing. And so 
I'm excited about the format. So that's that's what happens. So th right now, um, in for the summer, if you're in Bible book, you can order the personal study guide, or you can order the daily discipleship guide, and they're both there. They're about roughly the same cost. The only real tangible difference that you would notice is the teaching outline in Bible book is all the way in the back, and it's much much shorter. Um, it really is just kind of a teaching outline. And and that's one of the concerns I've got right now. Um, you can still get a teacher's book um, for that curriculum. And so you could have the full-blown teacher's book, use the daily discipleship guide or the personal study guide, and it all meshes together. Okay, so that sounds good. So the, the other change that's coming um, Gospel Project is coming to the end of its second cycle, okay? And so as it comes to the end of its second cycle, people are beginning to ask the question, what's next? They're asking it of me, we're asking it of LifeWay, and uh, LifeWay said, hey, we're making some changes. Pat Ford, who is our regional LifeWay guy, uh, called me and said, hey, I want to drop by because he knows that I like to stay up on literature and I, I, I work long term. And hey, I've got some stuff. Can I drop by next week? I said, sure, Pat. Always love to see you. Bring me goodies. And um, Pat drops by and I'm saying, hey, I, I've got my gospel project questions. And he goes, great. Lifeway made me send everything back the day after I talked to you because they've scrapped it and are starting over. And so what they have decided to do in the, fall, in the fall of 2018, they are going to replace the current personal study guide with a daily discipleship guide. So if you're using Gospel Project, and this is why we're starting to talk about I want to get this out to you so you can begin to think about it, think about how your class functions, and... Uh, ask me lots of questions, do some research. I'm going to feed you some material by email over the time when I get the stuff from Pat. I'm going to send it on to you. Same thing with Bible book. If you're using Bible studies for life, no change planned today. However, if this is successful, I think we'll see it change. Okay? Because Lifeway has made a huge commitment to trying to get people into study of God's Word. I see you writing ferociously. I have handouts that have everything I'm saying plus some that I'll just, I'm going to give to you, okay? And um, go ahead and hand them out and they'll read and I'll just talk to myself, okay? So uh, you're, just to save you from taking notes or have something to write on to where they're in context to what we're doing, Jeannie's going to pass out. Um, all of the stuff that I'm sharing with you comes from this set of handouts, okay? So you kind of understand what's going to happen. Um, and here's what we know about personal study guides. The personal study guide is designed to do this. It is the study before, and that's the key thing. It is set for really what they want is people to study the lesson, show up prepared, and then learn from one another during the group discussion. That's the formatting, okay? The leader's guide is separate, okay? And um, pre-meeting study is recommended. So what we're saying is we should be encouraging our learners to look at the lesson, come prepared. We're going to have a great discussion and apply it. It's great. It worked well for us for lots and lots and lots of years um, and until LifeWay kind of fell behind in curriculum. It got a little stale. And people said, why bother? And we kind of quit using it. This church hasn't, but we've got lots of curriculum lines that we're, we're dealing with. The Daily Discipleship Guide, here's how it's going to be formatted or is formatted. There'll be some changes, Daniel. You're, you'll be the only person who'll notice this. They're tweaking for the, if you order for the summer, you'll see a little bit of a change. There's some tweaks coming. Nothing major that I'm picking up on yet. But what they want to have happen or the formatting is learn during the session. So what they're acknowledging is people don't prepare ahead. So learn during the, Daniel rolls his eyes. People don't prepare ahead. So what we're saying is we acknowledge that. We're, everybody's busy. What we'll do is we'll try to set the hook and let them run with it. 
Okay, so it's kind of different in formatting. So learn during the session, study afterwards with five daily Bible readings. Okay, and then um, the leader's guide is included in the back of the book, and that will be the only leader's guide it currently, as I'm understanding it, that will be the only leader's guide for Gospel Project. It'll be in the back of the book. Okay? Um, there'll be some online things. None of that's where I can see it yet. As soon as I can see it, I'll let you guys know so that you can begin to look at it. Um, the Explore the Bible, they'll continue to produce a leader's guide. No pre-meeting study required. Uh, and this is, would be true. It's better for guests and better for absentees because, you know, you're not walking in to a group that's well prepared. Everybody's going to kind of start together. Um, then uh, talk it out questions for small groups within the class for further discussion. So if you've got three or four people that live at work at live at Dell, <laughs> work at Dell in your group or a retired group of men that already kind of get together for breakfast, they could incorporate this discussion question into that regular meeting that they have. Or if you get together for like a, you know, I know like uh, the Schumann's class gets together for a men's time and a women's time, you could, you know, pile a couple up and, and have your discussion. It just gives you some, a place to kind of get talking about God's word. Um, any questions about that? I mean, it's a, it's a different approach. And so I'm trying to give it to you way in ahead so that you can kind of think about it, ponder it, um, and begin to ask me questions. And that's really what I want to invite a dialogue over the next three months. Because when we get to the summer, uh, we're going to kind of hopefully have a, 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 a good discussion at that, that meeting. Because as we come out of the summer meeting, as we get ready for the summer, we're about two weeks away from ordering literature for the fall. And so I want, I want you to be well ahead of the thought process. Okay? Questions about that? I see some twitching going on. Nothing on CD. We have this thing called the Internet now. And... Um, You've heard of it. It's all going to the internet. Um, the today, and I keep saying today because every time I talk, I talk to Pat about every six weeks. Uh, it's about his cycle of coming by. Um, when I talked to him last, he was here last week, I think, two weeks ago. I talked to him two weeks ago, and he gave me a bunch of stuff. Some of it's already gone off of the internet, been replaced with slicker, newer stuff. Um, that the kit item initially will continue to be on a CD or DVD. It, it is also digital, and so you can download it. Either way, you've got to get it to your computer. For our church, for most of it, especially as we continue to put televisions in rooms and have really good uh, Wi-Fi coverage throughout our entire education space, the Internet probably is the way to go. It doesn't save us money <laughs> because the digital kit online versus digital kit in the vinyl bag right now is the same price. We do receive about a 50% cost reduction if you um, or if people in your class order a digital copy. So as we talk about literature, Basically, my literature line item in the budget, if you go back, it doesn't go up very quickly. Because basically what we did is the first two or three years that we had um, literature increases, we offset all of the increase by the number of people that were ordering a digital version of the, the personal study guide. And so it's about half of what a print version is. And so as your class gets more and more technological, people will start using their iPads more. When you kind of sense that, you're still always going to want to get a print copy, two or three or four. And we keep extras around, and I know where I can go get them. But um, it is a cost savings to your church. It's a good stewardship thing. As a matter of fact, I'm talking with Pat about two ideas about um, 
Lifeway has a, when the order blank that we give you is not the official Lifeway order blank. The official Lifeway order blank is eight pages, fine print with little bitty boxes. I mean, it's got the Spanish version. It's got the, it's all on there and you almost need to read it with a magnifying glass. Matter of fact, the only thing that we do is we open it, we look at the date in the top corner, this is the really fine print about when you can order and get the 5% discount, and then basically we throw it in the trash because it's just too much. It's, it, if I gave it to you, you would, you would come back to me and go, just give me something. And so we try to break it down to the things that we think are usable and go from there. If you hear of a piece and you want it, we'll be happy to order it for you. But trying to make it a manageable process so you can do it quickly in class, that's just is proven to be effective for us. Um, so as you move to and can use more of the digital, by all means do it. If you want to know what it costs to put a television, a 50 inch television in a classroom, um, it's about $500. Time we buy the TV, the bracket, and get the electrician here, depending on what the electrician runs into, it's about five to $600. And so we're halfway through our adult space. And if you say, gosh, I could never learn that, then I'm gonna send you to Don Harris and Virginia Wood because they have, are using or learning to use the digital media in their, in the parlor which presents me with a unique experience. Neither one of them have televisions where I'm moving them back to. So uh, what do I do? I don't know, but I'm gonna find out. And so as they get better and better about using digital media with their classes that are probably older than yours, then um, I, I think we all can do it, okay? Questions about the format or the cost structure. I know budget stuff's real exciting. Uh, we'll skip it. All right. So, did I skip one? Nope, no, I didn't. So, here's my big request. Okay. I have a request. The request is that you begin researching and praying. Um, this is a big change in the way we go about teaching. If you're in Gospel Project, it's a huge change for the way that we go about teaching. Uh, the way we will begin to encourage people to deal with a, a study piece. And so I want to make sure that we're prepared to lead through a change. Uh, I think it's a positive change, and I've got some what-ifs here in a minute. But begin just praying about it. How would this change your leadership? How would it enhance your discipleship and your group? those types of things. Let's just begin to pray about this and, and find out all that we can. That's what I'm doing over the next next few months is everything that I can find out, um, I'm going to do that. I'll be at a conference in April with educators from all over the state, and I'm pretty sure this will be a big topic, and uh, I'm hoping that Pat Ford will have more information for us and, and we can go from that. Um, so this is my request. I've got a challenge. My challenge is this. Pretty soon I'm going to send you samples. I'm going to send you samples of the Gospel Project, uh, the new format when they produce the little two lesson set. I will send that to you. I'm also going to send you Explore the Bible. Uh, I want you to look them over. Think about the approach, everything that we did in the, in the request. But, to, but that you can tangibly sit down and go, this is how I would prepare this lesson. This is what I think about this. And they'll have like little arrows that point to changes and things they've added or this is different. They do a good job with that, okay? So that's gonna be the challenge over the next two or three months. And then I want you to have a voice. You know me, we talk about things, I share stuff with you, I invite you to share stuff back with me. In this process, that won't change. We need to have a dialogue. Um, about how this will affect stuff. If, I, if I'm sensing that this is totally the, you know, it's just not going to work for you, then we'll have to do something different. And I'm okay with that. But if we've got good tools, I want to make the most of the tool. You know, you always go to the shed and get the sharpest saw. And that's what I want to do. I want to go to the shed and come back with the sharpest saw. 
Um, but your, uh, your input over the, and questions over the next two or three months are just things that are going to help me know what I need to be researching. And you're not going to hurt my feelings if you say, I don't like it. I may come back and say, have you thought about this? And you can go back and pray about it some more and come back and say, I thought about it, Larry, and I still don't like it. I'm okay with that. Okay? Um, what if, though, this is, this is what begins to get tantalizing for me. Okay? Now, remember I said when we started out, we have six curriculum items. What if we moved our adult biblical community groups to a single curriculum line for a three-year cycle? This is just what if -ing. Okay? I'm not saying this is what's going to happen, but just what if. Just kind of what if down through this with me. So what if we just pick one of these and we run it for the three-year cycle? Okay? What if all of our adult biblical communities groups used um, the personal disciple guide during that one three-year period? Or encouraging people intentionally to get in God's Word. And really making that a focus. Just for one cycle. What if our adult biblical community groups routinely encouraged daily Bible reading for that three-year cycle? We made it a focus. What if we could invite our pastor to preach on some of the passages and themes that are being going to be touched on during that three years? What would it do for our church if you taught it, they studied it, and Jared cleaned it up? Or something like that. <laughs> Don't tell him I said it that way, okay? <laughs> um, what if you taught it, they studied it, and he enhanced it? Sound better? Okay. Better choice of words. Um, now... This is just something I've been praying about in relationship to these changes. Um, I'm not saying this is what we should do. Um, I've been working and kind of toying with how I could do uh, a 20-minute lesson overview kind of weekly workers meeting from my house on a Wednesday night at a time that's convenient to you. And I, I got my format kind of worked out. And I felt really good about it. And I sat down and I went, I need to do this. Um, Four times, if I'm going to be fair to all our leadership. And I can't figure out how I can do it four times in a week. And so, um, now, obviously, this is just Larry's what if. This is just something that if you want to pray about crazy things, you hang around me. I'll give you some crazy things to pray about. But as I think about this, what would this do for somebody who's maybe grown up in the Catholic faith in my wife's class to their spiritual growth? What would this do for the divorced young man coming out of prison who found Christ in prison as getting involved in Bible study class? Does it move them forward? What about somebody who's taught or been in your class for 20 or 30 years, does this begin to challenge some of those people to obtain a new level of spiritual understanding? What if when we got together, you could say in a group of First Baptist folks, what would you think about that talk it out question? And we all kind of knew what we were talking about. And you say, well, I think this. Well, I think this. Well, I read this in Scripture. How does that impact this? And now we've got a whole different dialogue that can develop. Now, that's, that's Larry praying and about big things. And I like to do that. But the reality is you would have to make it happen. I'm just being honest with you. The, the people who are, I think, the most dedicated leadership in our church as a group is this group. 
And so how is this worth making it happen? That's going to be a pivotal question as we go towards that meeting in May. And it's a question that I'm not afraid for you to ask. Ask of me. Ask of yourself. I'm not afraid of that. Okay? Questions, comments? Yes, Don. Uh, you talked about changes in the curriculum for the adult Bible community. Okay. Uh, are there similar changes? Yes. Yes. The LifeWay's Gospel Project curriculum is adults to preschool. Okay. Um, LifeWay's Explore the Bible is adults and students. Okay. Um, they may have a children's version now. I can't remember. Um, Bible Studies for Life um, is adults to children. Also, one of the things that will happen in Gospel Project is um, they're going to begin to unitize it like they do Bible Studies for Life. So, like, you'll be able to go, if you ever go to Lifeway and you, you, you can pick up a family, a six-week family study on some topic, and if you're kind of looking, you go, this kind of looks like Sunday school material. That's because it is. They took the quarterly, they cut it in half, they, they produce two six-weeks and an odd. I call it an odd. That's my term. They call it a single. But they have two six-week study, and there's something to make it 13 weeks to work in church. They go back and they put a nice cover on a six-week study and a six-week study, and the other one goes to the hopper to, for other products. And so um, that's going to happen with Gospel Project as well. Uh, the other question, Jesse's. Um, yeah, I wish you hadn't asked me that because I don't have an answer for that. Um, I've asked input of the staff. The question was, I don't know if everybody heard it, how will the decision be made? To which I said, I really don't know. Um, this doesn't happen very often. There isn't a great blueprint in my ministry experience for a big wholesale change. I've only been through a mega change once. Um, and I, that was dictated to me, so it was kind of a no-brainer for me. In this decision, if I was going to assign values, percentages to things, um, your input to me is probably f at least 50% of the decision. Maybe even a little, maybe 60%. Um, if I can get the pastor to preach on some of the passages, that's gravy. Um, it helps our church. It gives us some, a, a new sense of unity to stuff, but that's gravy. Um, there's some cost analysis that goes into this that certainly in our church has to be part of the decision. I'm just being honest with you. Um, at this point, I can't, you know, as, as prices get published, um, we're going to continue to look to move things to the digital world just for the cost savings. That has to factor into it as well. Um, but ultimately... Um, it's going to come down to probably 60% what y'all think, about 40% uh, what Larry thinks, and about 20% of what the staff thinks. And Bob Hawkins is like looking at me like he does really bad math, and I do. And for right now, I'm going to ride with that, okay? And so, but you, your input uh, weighs heavily. Because, because, for me to walk in and say, and you know me by now, hopefully, I, I walk in and dictate very little to anybody. I want us to build a consensus. That's why we're talking about it now. We're, what, six months out? And we're talking about stuff that I can't even show you full copies yet, but we're starting to talk about it. Um, I, I want the dialogue. I want your input. And as I can send you and feed you stuff, that's going to be important. Am I going to force you to give up using Connect 360? No, that's just not my style. And I want you to be an effective teacher. My style is, is to give you the tools that you need to be effective. 
what I'm asking you to do is think about this and will it make you more effective? Can it amp up what's going on at First Baptist? You know, because as I look at what's happening in denominational life in general, um, independents are the largest section segment right now of growth is in independent churches. The doctrine of an independent church is all over the map. And as people come here, because this is a great family church, is a church that has great care, um, there are lots of really positive things about being a part of First Baptist. How do we help those people get on board with Bible study and move forward? We have a lady that's um, we have a lady that's attending us from a Lutheran background. Lutherans love Bible studies, and she came to me and she goes, "Larry, I'm just not." enjoying Bible study. I said, well, tell me why. And she goes, well, I'm a Lutheran. And I go, I, I know that. And she goes, it's just different. And I said, well, I know that. I said, let me see if I can put it in perspective for you. I said, when you go to a Bible study at a Lutheran church, it's like going to the doctor for that steroid shot. They're going to load up that big syringe, and they're going to give you a big steroid shot, and you're going to get over it in a hurry. You got one and done kind of thing, you know, six weeks and you move on to something else. Okay? So in Southern Baptist life, it's kind of like polio vaccine. We put a few drops under your tongue every time you come to the doctor. That's the way we approach it. We're we're counting on that you're gonna love being here and we're gonna just dribble it out to you every Sunday. So that you just kind of osmosis it almost and over time you're going to know all the, the great stories over time you're going to grow to be a teacher over time and said in the Lutheran church you try to get it in one shot we're here we're playing over time and that's a big difference and so as we look at these curriculum things not everybody's coming to us Baptist like they did maybe in the 70s or 80s. The, the, the clientele is changing is what I'm saying, okay? People are starting to leave. That means I probably should have looked at my watch. And so here's, I, I just love this picture and I just added to this my what if. You know, if you put a match to the end of a row of matches, interesting things happen. Is this an opportunity in our church to stick a match to the end of a row of matches? And, and to ignite something. It, could this be the pillar of fire over First Baptist that draws Round Rock to it? Didn't think I'd get back to the pillar of fire, did you? <laughs> uh, let's see. Moving uh, next steps. Let's go there. And I'm just going to brush through this real quick. Um, last time I challenged you to, to do some different things. Um, the first one is just using uh, Chromecast. Here's something that in, in folks dealing with it over the last time, turn the television on first and let it get going. It takes the Chromecast a while. We've had some people that have gotten frustrated with the system, kind of need to turn the television on, let it get going, then um, sign in on your device and use it. But this is a really good tool. Apple TV works the same way. I just kind of read that uh, real quick to you. Try some things new. Uh, we talked about Right Now Media, and I think that's really good. How many of you have ever, and this is, I was going to show you this, but um, I'm just going to tell you about it now. How many of you, since we've talked about absentees, how many of you know that you can go into Shelby Next, go to the absentee button, and go to reports, and do session, and it will show you everybody that was absent Matter of fact, if you did digital records today, if you did it on your phone or whatever, you could go look and see everybody that was absent today and send them an email right from Shelby Next without any searching. It just does it for you. Anybody taking advantage of that? Well, there, there may be a little video for next week's Informer, okay? It's really easy to do. You just, on your computer, there's a button. It's attendance. You drop over the attendance menu. The bottom one's reports. You drop into reports. The second tab over is absentees. You click absentees, and I think it's session. 
and you'll see everybody that missed today. And then over in the corner, you'll see a little envelope. It's not very big, but it just looks like a little envelope. If you click the envelope, everybody in that list, you can send them a text or an email right from the computer. Just type it out. There's a, even a way to make it personal if you want to make it personal. Okay, you can do at name, all caps, hit enter. Don't do the comma. For some reason, the comma messes it up. Drop down a line, say, hey, missed you, and it'll go, dear Larry, missed you today. Our lesson was on so-and-so. You might want to look at this scripture for next week. Don't want you to be behind. And then the next one to go, dear Terry, <laughs> and, and it'll all be personal um, and until they figure out you're using the computer to send them form mail. Okay, but it is a good tool. Use it. You can also uh, have it assign interactions that way too. Um, yeah, let's just skip that. All right. Um, questions, comments, and then we'll go. If you want to, I'll walk you over and we'll take a tour. Man, it scares me when you don't have any comments or questions. Yes, Susan. Yes, in the move, did I not say that? In the initial move back, you will return home, okay? Now, once you've returned home, because that's the easiest way to communicate it, I think, rather than make a whole bunch of changes now and try to, like, get everybody somewhere where they think they ought to be, that just seems like a disaster waiting to happen. So we're just going to say everybody goes home. Once everybody gets home, then we need to make some changes and swaps, okay? Because um, some people have outgrown rooms. We're overusing some rooms. Um, we've gained a room, ground level in the sanctuary. If I get a chance to use it, we've got a class that can come down. I've already talked to some of you about moving. If you really like the space that you're in now, um, my wife's going, no, I don't. <laughs> so... I'll let, I'll let you two ladies talk afterwards, okay? Um, and then whatever you decide is fine with me. No, we're, there's some changes that need to happen, and I know that, but just, in the, just to make it simple, everybody goes home. And then we'll work from there, okay? That's the best way I know to do it. But that is a great question. Other questions? All right. Let me pray for you, and we'll, we'll call it done tonight. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for tonight, Lord, and a lot to digest tonight, a lot to digest. Lord, I would just ask for wisdom, and your word tells us that we can have it in abundance. So, Lord, I ask for that. Lord, for your grace, I ask for that as well. Lord, change is always a difficult proposition, and how we deal with it, Lord, I ask that it would bring glory and honor to you. Lord, some things make my heart flutter a little bit because I'm a little nervous. Calm my jitters, Lord. For those things that we struggle with, help us to have a vision of how it will impact the lives of those that we love and care about week in and week out. Lord, thank you for the people that have helped me make this meeting possible Lord, to volunteer their time. Lord, it's uh, so helpful to me and so encouraging. Lord, keep us safe as we go home. I pray this in your name. Amen. How, you can go ahead and stop it, Clark. How many of you want to walk across? Pretty much everybody. Okay, I tell you what. Um, let's, let's do this. Let's go... Just to make it easy, let's go out the hallway, we'll go down.